okay so uh, the last lecture we have discussed the different treatment model uh, treatment modalities for the peptic ulcer diseases their pathology their symptomatology and the possible management so in the possible management we have already discussed the lifestyle modifications and the medicines which are used nowadays the medicines are very much useful and the very few patients are required the surgical procedure for this peptic ulcer surgery peptic ulcer disease so today we discuss some uh, surgical procedures which may be performed in case of the peptic ulcer patients so uh, the indication for the surgery we already had discussed just for the quick recap the patients who fail to respond to the medical therapy and the patients who wants a quick relief and because uh, when the patient fed up with this recurrence the of the disease as the nature of the duodenal ulcers which recur again and again or patients have very long time history of the having this disease chance of the malignant transformation so in that cases surgery may be indicated patients having repeated pain patients either uh, patients present with the sign of the complications of the peptic ulcer just like the patients having obstructions due to the scarring of the pylorus and the gastric outlet obstruction syndrome or the patients having hemorrhage or the perforations so or either uh, the surgeon is suspecting the any kind of the malignancy due to mal uh, cancer or the gastric cancer in any patients then in that case the surgery is indicated and we, uh, we must uh, take the patient to the surgical process so before doing the surgery the counseling of the patient is very much essential because uh surgery gastro surgery especially are not uh, always having uh, uh without complication there must be some sequel there must be some complications to be happen after the surgical procedure so patient must be aware about, uh, about that complication the what kind of the complications patient may suffer what kind of sequel may be happen after the surgery so that's why the and the counseling of the patient is very much essential so now we discuss about the surgical procedure so first surgical procedure which is uh which is indicated in the gastric ulcer uh that is billroth first billroth first gastrectomy and for the duodenal ulcer there is other procedures the like billroth uh, second gastrectomy gastro jejunostomy truncal vagotomy and drainage highly selective vagotomy truncal vagotomy and enterectomy so these surgical procedures can be performed in the duodenal ulcer patients where the patient may be benefited with these surgical procedures so one by one we discuss first the billroth gastrectomy because the billroth first and billroth second are almost the similar pro uh, procedures just a little different so first we discuss billroth first gastrectomy as the name suggests the billroth who who, who were the first surgeon to perform this procedure in 1881 this procedure was performed for the gastric ulcer so here we see that uh, gastrectomy the name suggests that we are going to remove the part of the stomach so the most common part of the stomach which ha which uh, which undergoes into the ulceration that is the lesser curvature so in this case in this case when the patient is indicated for uh, surgery and patient having uh, the uh, uh, ulcers in the lesser curvature so in that case uh, here we have to remove the half of the stomach that include the greater greater curvature uh, sorry that includes the main part of the lesser curvatures along with some part of the greater curvatures and we create a stoma the stoma means we create a, a small hole or opening where we can anastomose the duodenum and to and anastomosis so you can see in the picture that first uh, 
we uh, means the major thing which we done here we remove the part of the stomach especially the lesser lesser curvature and we create a stoma in the greater curvature side and the size of the stoma should be equal to the uh, diameter of the duodenum so that uh, di duodenum can be anastomosed to that part now we go to the step wise what are the major step in the bellows first uh, bellows surgery the second include half of the portion of the first so first uh, mm, i'd like to discuss uh, the steps and the major uh, things which to major structures which should be preserved during the surgery so uh, the uh, the access of the that that uh, stomach and duodenum is taken through the midline right uh, either midline incision or right paramedial incisions uh, incision should be long up from epigastrium to up to the umbilicus so uh, to get the better access of the both organs then the first step after reaching into the abdominal cavity we identify we identify the structure we identify the um, both structure duodenum and uh, stomach and then we have to identify the site of the resection means which part we are going to resect and that's why the extent of how much part we are going to remove that should be estimated properly after the physical examination after the direct examination nowadays to laparoscopic surgery is also performed so in that also the similar procedure we first we have to look the both organs that which part you are going to uh, excise excise and how much part are we are going to excise then second step should be you have to detach the and mobilize these four, these uh, these both viscera uh, duodenum as well as the uh, this uh, stomach you know that the stomach is attached to the uh, lesser curvature uh, through the lesser omentum and the greater omentum so that's why we have to separate the the uh, lesser curvature to the lesser omentum and right uh, greater curvature from the greater curvature uh, omentum so to, after the clamping and the ligation of the vessels major vessels uh, through the omen of the omental uh, we after ligation of the vessels uh, clamping and ligation we have to remove we have to detach the stomach we have to free the stomach from this omental so that we can mobilize the stomach and we can we have to take out the stomach from outside the wound and then uh, and that, that uh, take a look that which part we are going to excise so then the next part should be after the mobilization of the duodenum and the stomach uh, second part uh, next step should be to divide the stomach uh, duodenum and the stomach after the clamping so where should i where should we clamp so you know the in the uh, in the in the duodenum we have to uh, clamp the duodenum 1 cm from the pylorus or the 1 cm from the ulcers if the duodenal for if you are doing the procedure for the duodenal so the bellow second in that uh, case also we have to clamp the stomach 1 cm distal to the uh pylorus and in the in the stomach we have to clamp 2 cm proximal to the lesser curvature where the the the, the ulcers are there understand so proximally 2 cm and distally 1 cm we have to clamp and we have to divide the uh, structure after in between clamps means two clamps in the duodenum and two clamps in the stomach then in between clamps we have to divide the uh, divide we have to excise and then with the middle part we have to remove the next step should be anastomosis of the both hands so in the in, in the stomach you can see if doing if we are doing the bellows first that duodenum has a small uh, lumen while the when you divide the half of the stomach you leave the long uh, it's long opening so in that we have to start suturing the stomach 
just like in the picture is from the you know, lesser lesser curvature part and uh, towards the greater curvature lesser curvature to we have start switching from here to here and we we leave the small stoma uh, as equal to lumen of the duodenum then we anastomose end to end anastomosis of this part so here we have identified uh, so anastomose this part then second part uh, next part should be the closing of the wound so while the closing of the wound we have to uh, in uh, in the take care we have to take care that uh, while the closing the wound we must uh, put some uh, uh, drain inside and uh, any uh, before uh, before closing wound we must sure about the anast uh, about the hemostasis there no should, no bleeding should be there and the the, the leakage of the the suturing or anastomosis is a very common so before closing we must sure that there is no leakage in the anastomosis next part is the uh, the post operative care the, in the post operative care the patient must be uh, we must keep the patient orally nil since uh, next uh, two to three days and the patient all the nutrition should be given uh, through this um, iv roots and the, and the, the regular the nasogastric tube insertion should be there so that uh, the gastric content should be aspirated uh, that will avoid the um, parity because after the surgery the intestine the gut we go into the uh, non mobility uh, non uh, become non mobile and the parityless go into that situation that bowel movements are almost stop uh, due to this the surgical procedure so that's why to stop the uh, intestinal obstructions we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, suck all the gastric contents all the gastric uh, secretions to avoid this gastric distensions and later on the other complication so this post operative period uh, the we must take a close look to the patient for the any anastomosis leakage any hemorrhage any kind of the complication may happen so we must be very carefully uh, after the surgical procedure in the post operative period so this is by uh, doing this by this method you see the these are the steps in the bill of first gastrectomy now come to the bill of second operations so here Uh, actually this procedure was performed accidentally uh, uh, a surgeon was planned to do the uh, bedroth first uh, and, and and then he saw he see that patient is not able to do this process means uh, due to the gastric cancer that patient was the gastric cancer and uh, uh, he was not not able to remove that uh, pylorus part so that's why he performed the gastric uh, this this procedure where he just not remove the uh, duodenum part and just uh, detach the duodenum from the pylorus and uh, close the end part close the stump and and do the anastomosis of the uh, end to side anastomosis in the jejunum part and you can see in the picture that this, the greater curvature of the stomach is uh, directly anastomosed to the side of the jejunum and here the duodenum is not removed and duodenum stump is still there so you can see in the picture that the food is coming from the esophagus stomach and directly to the this part this is not anastomosis part it's on directly comes from the jejunum so the, the the here the gastro jejunostomy procedure is here after excising this portion this uh, gastric uh gastrectomy means the bellroth first include the gastrectomy and gastroduodenostomy while the below second having the gastrectomy followed by the gastrojejunostomy so means the, the stomach is directly anastomosed to the jejunum part all the procedures all and the pre operative and post operative uh, care is all similar to the bellroth first operations so that's why we have performed the bellrose second bellrose second uh, uh, operation is more significant 
and in is more uh, helping at the and less complication in the patient of the duodenal ulcer so nowadays below first is very rarely performed when it is required then below second is most com uh, more commonly performed than below first operation next procedure the tranquil vagotomy and drainage so tranquil vagotomy is vagotomy means we have just uh, denervated the vagus nerve supply because we know we are the the vagus nerve has uh, the stomach has a rich uh, the supply of the vagus nerve that induce induce the secretions of the gastric acid secretions so when the patient has hyper secretions in the uh, hyper secretion of the gastric acid that may be called that that causing the gastric ulcers or the duodenal ulcer so in that case uh, we we just uh, disconnect this uh, vagus nerve this, we just disconnect this. you can see in the picture we just disconnect the vagus nerve after the ligation we just disconnect the vagus nerve both is both their anterior and both posterior uh, anterior and posterior both uh, um, both nerves uh, both parts of the nerve anterior and post means both segment we have to denervate it but uh, the problem is that after doing this vagotomy the, because you know the vagus nerve is mixed nerve both have sensory and motor part so if you disconnect this this uh, this uh, this portion from the through the nerve so that portion become uh, less motile or amotile so that's why we have to do some drainage procedure drainage procedure means we have to facilitate to uh, uh, the food to move forward in the in, in the alimentary canal because there is a uh, when we denervated this antrum part of the and uh, the body part of the stomach there is a, the peristalsis movement are reduced so much so that this the food is not moving by this peristalsis movements that's why to facilitate the movement of that food we have to perform the drainage procedure drainage procedure may be the pyloroplasty or the gastrointestinal pyloroplasty is performed in the patient where when the pylorus is a little bit constricted and uh, patient uh, the, the food is not able to move through pylorus with this their own uh, gravitational effect or uh, through this slight uh, peristalsis movement so in that patient pyloroplasty is performed we discuss the pyloroplasty procedure in later uh, videos but this in the gastrointestinostomy uh, in that case uh, gastrointestinostomy is very easy uh, to perform and very easy to done that is more effective in the here just like in the previous below second we have to not excise we are not going to excise any part just uh, we have to anastomose the jejunum through the greater curvature of the stomach so that the food is directly uh, passed through the from the uh, stomach to the jejunum directly and we are not going to excise any part so the all the gastric juices secreted all the bile coming from the duodenum is mixed into the jejunal part so the 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 digestion of the food is very less affected so this vagot trunkal vagotomy and drainage the also procedure which which was which was performed later pyloroplasty we have already had discussed i think this procedure uh, when do the pyloroplasty to increase the size of the lumen of the pylorus we just make a longitudinal incision in the pylorus and close this incision long uh, horizontally just like you see in the picture we are making an incision longitudinal on the pylorus and we are closing the incision horizontally so that the 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 size of the lumen of the pylorus is increased and widened so it facilitate the proper drainage of the food from the stomach to the duodenum next procedure is highly selective frontal vagotomy in the vagotomy in the trunkal vagotomy there is two trunk of the vagus nerve anterior trunk and posterior trunk so we are just uh, just ligating the both trunk and divide it but in the highly selective trunkal vagotomy we, we go further we find the we find the 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 part of the nerve of the uh, part of the vagus nerve which is which is supplying to the paratrasal mass who, who who which is responsible for the Uh, hyper secretion of the gastric acid so here we come we are not uh, 
disconnecting the complete uh, section of the vagus nerve we are just uh, disconnecting the particular segment of that nerve so in that position uh, in this in this uh, uh, operations the drainage procedure is not uh, essential because we are not com completely disconnecting the vagus nerve supply we are just uh, disconnecting only some part of the stomach some part of the the parietal cells which are uh, responsible for the high blood acid secretions so that's why in this uh, procedure this drainage procedure the gastrogenostomy or the pyloplasty may be not essential so that this 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 was the most satisfactory operation performed for the duodenal ulcers in in earlier days and uh, this was considered as the gold standard surgical procedure for the duodenal ulcers because the Uh, complications are very much less and the procedure is very easy and uh, uh, the less bleeding and very less uh, discomfort to the patient and we are going we can do these procedures now, but nowadays these all the surgical procedures are very less performed and less required due to the good medications are there uh, anti secretory medications are there so the patients uh, are very much reduced for that in surgical interventions next procedure is truncal vagotomy and uh, entrectomy so here uh, the the procedure pro, uh, the, the this procedure is indicated in the patient where the the ulcers are there and the chronic ulcers are there and there is a chance of conversion of these ulcers to the malignant transformation so in that case we have to excise that part we have to remove that part of the stomach all the duodenum and then we perform the anastomosis along with the vagotomy tracheal vagotomy so that the uh, we further decrease the chance of that uh, hyperacid secretion and recurrence of the ulcer we have reduced very much so this truncal vagotomy we, we already discussed which is disconnect the portion of the vagus nerve along with entrectomy means we are uh, excising the particular that particular part of the stomach so we, we are as, we, as uh, in the uh, initially we have uh, i told you that there must be some cpl of that uh, uh, this peptic ulcer surgery no surgical procedure is free from the complication there must be very little or more complications are there so there is a list of the complications of the list of the sequel means the that may happen after the peptic ulcer surgery that includes in the early stage the peritic ileus the hemorrhage from the surgical side intestinal obstruction may be there because the food is directly inferred from the stomach to the uh, jejunum and uh, because of the less motility in the stomach uh, because the less the stomach is there the food is not properly digested and properly massed so the large bolus if it uh, directly enters into the jejunum that may cause the intestinal obstruction in, uh, in intestinal obstructions and the leakage of the stomach which is also very much very much common complication that may occurs that's why we must uh, Uh, while the closing the stump of the duodenum uh, in the below second procedure we must take care the and the duodenum should not be inflamed we we must uh, uh, avoid the st stress suture so that uh, the duodenum is not going to the stress the tissue is not going to stress and not going to inflamed and rupture so that uh, the, the, the the we can avoid this leakage and later on um, how to uh, know that uh, the patient having the uh, the leakage in post operative period if uh, after 2 to 3 days or within 7 days if the suddenly patient feel a uh, severe pain and the peritonitis is there and the uh, the basal pneumonia may be there in that patient and uh, because the gastric content uh, is, uh, is 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 leaked into the Uh, the other abdominal cavity peritoneal cavity and there may be peritonitis may be there so if they in the post operative period the patient suddenly feel the peritonitis pain fever and all that then you may suspect the leakage of the stomach then uh, other complications just uh, which can occur later that is a recurrent ulceration is also very very much common that uh, the reflex gastritis is there because the st stomach uh, 
and become very less in the, especially in the uh, well growth first surgery so that the stoma the joining part of the duodenum and the stomach so due to the reflex of the bile that part the may uh, undergo into the recurrent ulcerations and the most uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, ulcerations that may cause the fistula is the gastrointestinal fistula you know we, we see in uh, in the abdomen you know the the colon is just above this stomach so when you perform the gastrointestinostomy and the is that is that that uh, stoma part that uh, anastomosis part if leaked or if there is infected then just above there is a duodenum so that may cause that that that, that may cause the ulceration in the colon wall and may cause the gastrointestinal colic fistula so that gastrointestinal colic fistula is very much uh, uh, have very much uh, difficulties for the patient because that patient may suffer the uh, severe diarrhea after every meal and the very foul smelling vomiting may be there and the vomiting may contains the the fecal matter so the, that that gastro jejunal colic is suspected in the, in the post operative period if patient suffering this kind of the problems and the small stomach syndrome is there because uh, we are in the both of the the below the first and below second we have removed the part of the stomach so stomach is reduced and other uh, procedure where we are uh, denervating that that part of the stomach the through vagotomy so that there the movement of that uh, uh, reduce the movement of the stomach so the, that uh, the the reflex relax relaxation of the stomach is not there because we have denervated the, the stomach through uh, uh, stomach and by disconnecting this vagus nerve so when the receptive relaxation is not there in the stomach that's why the stomach feels very uh, feels very early means when the patient take little food and and then the early satiety is there means the patient is not able to take the proper food even a small amount of the food may uh, may end satiety and uh, the patient feel uh, feel his stomach is filled with the food Uh, though he he or she has taken very small amount of food because his stomach is not relaxing and that may cause the irregular on the long time it may cause the weight loss in the patient because patient is not able to take the proper nutrition so nutrition deficiencies may be there bile movement is also a complication which can occur due to the reflex of the bile through the duodenum to the stomach that may cause the bile vomiting and the the early dumping and late dumping this dumping is a phenomena the syndrome is uh, is there which occurs usually after the post operative period uh, in this uh, after this in, in the surgery so in the next slide we discuss the early dumping and the late dumping they are the uh, typical phenomena which can, which occurs just after taking the meal and after the 2 uh, to 3 hours of the meal so along with this early and then uh, the dump, late dumping this post vagotomy diarrhea where the patient feels very uh, the hot uh, the boiling water is passing through the uh, through the diarrhea and uh, this occurs after the uh, vagotomy so it's a, a complications that can occur uh, malignant transformations is also have seen associated with the surgical procedure in few cases that uh, after the surgical procedures the the ulcer changes into the malignant and the nutritional consequences it should be there we are, we are because we are changing the the natural route of the food and we have diverging the route so that's why the the absorption and the digestion is also affected so that nutritional consequences may cause the the different type of the anemia and the patient may Uh, have the weight loss gallstone is also sometimes have been associated in the, in the post operative period of this uh, this type of the surgery so here we discuss the early dumping and late dumping uh, early dumping syndrome is there when the patient suddenly take the food uh, when the patient take the food and after uh, just after uh, almost uh, immediate taking the food the patient having the symptom of the epigastric fullness sweating lightheadedness and the tachycardia cold and colic pain and diarrhea that usually occurs in the uh, in the patient when uh, 
taking this especially uh, carbohydrate rich food so what happens so why redumping occurs uh, uh, when the patient take the food and uh, in, after the in below the first and below the second surgery uh, surgery uh, have done in that patient so when the patient take food then uh, the food is directly entered to the jejunum after the uh, food into the stomach and into the uh, directly from stomach to the jejunum so this uh, this high osmotic food fluid uh, high osmotic food going into the uh, to the jejunum so due to that uh, high osmotic value the small uh, the, the large amount of the fluid is sequestrated into the uh, stomach and the, in the jejunum so that the patient uh, uh, went into the hypovolemia because the, the to counter that high osmotic value in that food the the great amount of the fluid is sequestrated from the blood to the, the intestine the uh, epigastrium so that the epigastrium fullness is there sweating lightness and tachycardia and all these things may be these symptoms may uh, may be there in that patient that condition is called the early dumping the late dumping phenomena is there which occurs after the two and a half hour after the patient uh, after taking food and uh, where uh, sometime when the patient take the food then after two, uh, two to three hours the patient suddenly feels tremor faintness and the uh, nausea epigastric pain and such a patient suddenly lie that phenomena occurs due to the the reactive hypoglycemia so what happened when the food directly into the uh, from the inter from the uh, stomach to the Due uh, in in jejunum, and then uh, that that uh, that food has the rich in glucose, so that reflects the uh, gives sensation to the pancreas that the, the food is having high glucose content. So so to to, to consume that high glucose uh, uh, high glucose level, uh, pancreas uh, release high amount of the. Uh, insulin that causes the hypoglycemia, react to hypoglycemia in that patient, and that patients may may having this tremor and faintness, these type of the symptoms. So usually recover the patients recover with this uh, the medicines often tried, and sometimes uh, uh, itself patient may recover these type of the complications in later life. And the other procedures, uh, if the other complications, just like the early these, uh, uh, these, uh, the small stomach syndrome and the post vegetative diarrhea and other nutritional consequences are there, jejunal polycrystalla. So, in to counter all these type of the surgery, the bile vomiting, early and late dumping, if patient is not responding to that medication or to try it. We must uh, give a revision surgery, uh, done a revision surgery in the patient. Revision surgery that uh, we have to perform one more surgery to counter the counter complication of that surgery we have earlier performed. So that uh, revision surgery should be the RU1, RU and Y divergent surgery or the RU and Y bypass surgery. So in the RU and Y bypass surgery here, we have not excised any other part of the body. We just uh, connect directly the stomach uh, to the jejunum, and we just bypass the stomach and the duodenum. So this uh, this uh, RU and Y bypass surgery may be uh, indicated in the patient with having severe uh, post-surgical sequelae of the this uh, peptic ulcer surgery. Uh, now, now the complications of the peptic ulcers are their perforations, bleeding, and anastomosis. So, in the next lecture, we discuss the these three complications, three major complications, and how we can manage these complications.